Thanks, everyone. I know um, it's, a, it's a short time before coffee, and I'm, I'm here to try and keep you awake in that, that time. The first thing I was asked as I was coming in was, did I bring my checkbook? And I, the answer is, of course. But um, I just wanted to introduce you firstly to, to RMB, because uh, we run a multi-branded strategy, and we, we appear across the continent, Sub-Saharan Africa, in multiple brands from Ashburton, which you'll see in South Africa, through Wesbank, which is a very popular brand, FNB you'll see across the continent, and then RMB is the area, the division I work in, which focuses on the corporate and investment banking. We're the type of guys that are typically funding these type of uh, uh, sort of industries. I won't bore you with too much more detail on that, but that's just to locate where I sit within the first round group. The first round group is listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. We, as I mentioned, we're a pan-African business. We've got strong presences in West Africa, Eastern Africa, and obviously Southern Africa, and we've typically done deals, large transactions across the continent. Again, that's just to give you a sense of the, the scope, I guess, of my topic and my mandate. This was the, the press on the day that I was asked to do this presentation. I thought, well, what am I gonna tell you guys in the industry where our chief economist, Etienne LaRue, has got one big article out there saying, the economy's in a tailspin, we've got one chance. And I'll, I'll just highlight the severity of it. And, you know, this is the environment that we work in in a bank uh, in, in South Africa, in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And just to summarize his, his presentation or his, his article, it's the longest down cycle, business down cycle. If you look at the, the business confidence index, it has been going down for the longest period ever. post euphoria as well. The GDP growth has been decreasing for the longest period. Forget about uh, you know, dot-com crashes, et cetera, et cetera. This is the longest downswing we as South Africa have faced. And the challenge we have, I guess, um, and I say this under license from Etienne, our, our chief economist, is that the levers we have to pull to get out of uh, this downswing are very, very limited. Global growth, you've all heard about the trade wars. That's not gonna help us. Monetary, we've got very little ability to lower rates because we need the portfolio flows coming into the country. Fiscal, Government doesn't have any money to bail out the SOEs. And the only lever left to pull is a political lever. And he mentioned a couple of levers, and uh, the reason why I'm raising this is because a lot of these apply to this sector. And that is, firstly, cutting red tape. And we were talking way leaves a little bit earlier. And probably the most important thing is spectrum auctioning. It's a very simple, or a relatively simple lever, in my view, to pull. But that's, that's the context of, of you know, what I was thinking through as, as I was coming to this presentation. So I was trying to understand where does the sector fit in in this environment? The other interesting point that our economists were, were raising is, well, what are businesses doing in this environment? A lot of them selling non-core businesses. They are creating new strategic alliances, JVs, focusing on operational efficiencies, new products, et cetera, et cetera. But most importantly, they're adopting new technologies and e-commerce. And this is, this is the game that we're in. And what was interesting is this graph, which is corporates in South Africa are spending more on information uh, technologies, computer equipment, et cetera, and more on research and development. And that's a, that's a green shoot, in my view. The next part of the presentation I pulled, not from our economists, but more from, our, um, from the ITU, to try and understand why is this an important lever or an important investment uh, in, in terms of turning the economy around and getting the growth. And this chart talks about, this is the ITU, talks about the digital ecosystem and the correlation with GDP per capita. And the, the, the key takeaway, I guess, is they, they separated the, um, the thinking into two, OECD countries and non-OECD countries. So let's call it low down in the, the development curve. A 10% increase in the digital ecosystem index increases the GDP growth by 1.5%. Okay, that's a massive lever. If you think about it, we're battling to get economic growth of above 1% in South Africa. So 10% increase 
And the Digital Ecosystem Index can really be a major lever. Uh, sorry, and that's for, for the OECD countries. For non-OECD countries where we sit, uh, it's an even bigger uh, yield. Sorry, I've got that the wrong way around. One and a half percent for OECD and one percent for non-OECD. So it, it begs a bit of thinking as to, well, what is this digital ecosystem? And I just want to summarize it for you, just to give you a feeling for it. It's the institutional and regulatory framework. It's the connectivity. It's the infrastructure that we have. And again, this is sort of your space. It's the education we have around that. Uh, the household digitization. Uh, competition within the sector. Uh, digitization of production. So our, our factories, our, our companies digitized. Uh, and then it's digital industries. And there's probably a little bit less of this, but you, know, you can imagine it's the digital export industries, the Amazons, etc., Wikipedia. So major, major driver. The next part of it, I, I just wanted to touch on the regulatory framework uh, around that. I don't want to spend too long on this, but uh, you know, I, I took advantage of the fact that the minister was here earlier. But the regulatory framework is a major supporting factor, and it really it's, it's correlated. The, the correlation between a good regulatory framework and the growth in that digital uh, index, it, it's highly correlated. Um, if you look at where South Africa, I just picked four large economies across the continent, and where do we as uh, South Africans fail? And that's on the mandate of the regulator. And I think we, we all know the... Uh, uh, the legal loggerheads that have been uh, between ICAS and the Department of Communications now hopefully solved. So you can see that in South Africa's uh, index there. And the other one is, is competition. Now this might sound a bit unusual, and unfortunately they don't give us a, a lot of detail behind that, but I think it's a function of the concentration of our industries, which can be good and bad. Obviously concentrated industries, big ability to raise capital and deploy. But let's just have a look at how we compare, I'll just breeze through that quickly, how we compare to the rest of the world on the, the continent. So they categorize four main categories of, of regulatory uh, standards, if you will. First generation um, through to fourth generation. You can see most of Africa is sitting in the sort of second, third generation. And just to give you a feeling for what does a good regulator look like? So, we sitting in South Africa at a level three, let's call it, enabling investment, which we have. It's uh, innovation and access, dual focus and stimulating competition, and, uh, and, and consumer protection. But level four, the next level, is where the regulator is an integrated regulation. Uh, it is working together with the industry, both progressing economic and social policy agenda. And I think that's where we need to strive uh, as South Africa and, and the continent. So that, we've spoken a bit about the digitization uh, you know, of, of, of an economy, we've spoken about the regulatory framework, but I think the, the area you guys will be, will be most interested in is the, um, the impact of broadband penetration. So it's all very well having these industries out there, but you need to be able to get to the consumer. And here it was another correlation that the ITU did. Uh, and this, this uh, information is publicly available, you can go and have a look. But their, their study, just to try and interpret this for you, is that for countries with GDP per capita less than 22,000, there's a very high correlation uh, between growth, GDP growth, and broadband, wireless broadband penetration, and that's the green bars over there. And to, to read that out for you, a 10% increase in the mobile penetration would yield a 1.8 to 2% increase in GDP. Again, that's a massive number. It's a very big lever to pull. What they've found now, if you look at the dark blue bars, is on the, the wireless, or sorry, the, the uh, wired or the fiber penetration and the impact on, on, G, on GDP growth. And that tends to have a greater impact on the higher income countries. Um, and you'll see there, so for high-income countries, a 10% increase in fixed uh, broadband will, will yield about a 1.5% increase in GDP. Again, not as high a lever, but, but still there. So what, what does it mean for fiber players? What does it mean for, for 5G? What does it mean for, for, for wireless guys? I guess the, the quick win to get the economy going is the wireless uh, penetration, broadband wireless. 
And thereafter, and you know, you'll find the, the, the fiber and the, 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 the fixed penetration uh, being more useful. But you'll always find in any economy a, a combination of both. So in the cities, you can imagine absolutely, you know, fibering up the cities makes 100% sense. But you know, this is all about the speed of, of getting out there. Uh, look, the chart that I've got on the, on the bottom there just gives you a sense of, of how we, as South Africa, compared to the other major economies. You can see, in my view, that uh, we've got a long way to go in the fixed broadband penetration still. So I agree with earlier speakers. We are quite well penetrated from a, uh, just a general mobile penetration, but to get to the, uh, the broadband, the mobile broadband penetration for me is quite important. Nigeria is a key market for us, and we certainly see a lot of opportunity there as well. Kenya seems to be a little bit of the darling in the sector. Um, I, I think it's a relatively small market, but you know, there's still a lot to be done there. So I was chatting to one of our competitors earlier, because you know, the, the topic of the, of the discussion is, well, where do you invest in a low growth environment? So I've highlighted the sector is a very good one. And certainly internally, we, um, we have a lot of focus on the sector and a lot of appetite for, for investing in the sector. So my trade secrets, you know, what are, what are we focused on internally at, at RMB? The very first thing, I, I think there's a massive investment required in commercializing the high demand spectrum. I think it's been a, a story that's been spoken about for, for far too long, and we certainly look forward to the, the regulatory developments and the, the bringing of the spectrum, uh, high demand spectrum through to the market. We've got a little bit of a discussion that's going to happen around the, 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 the WERN and how that's going to work. Um, but this, to me, is a, is a major unlock for the sector. A, a key theme for us is still on the sharing of infrastructure. Uh, we're a big funder to the tower sector. Um, I'll talk to you now. We've just completed a, a massive $1.8 billion refinancing of, of IHS towers, uh, which is a, a pan-African player. But we still think in South Africa there's a huge opportunity for the big multinational operators or the mobile network operators to release these towers uh, and, and uh, cash, uh, generate cash from them. That said, I still think there's a, a huge amount more fiber that we need to put in the ground, uh, which is good news. I, I think there has been a lot of investment. It's been a very easy sell story internally to our credit committees to, to support us to invest in, in, in fact, uh, probably most of you guys out here, um, but I, I, and I think we increasingly we need to be a bit more selective. We as, a, as an industry, we can't just be rolling out fiber, uh, you know, double investing fiber on top of fiber. Uh, so that, but we still see very positive uh, movement in this space. The, the third sector, which is which is enhancing to to fiber players, I guess, uh, and that's not meant to be a bank. It's the best icon I could find for for data centers. Um, there's a lot of investment happening. Uh, you may or may not be aware, but it's happening. Uh, international interest in, in our data center sp uh, space. And that, to me, is a major enabler of, of the next part of it, which is the, the cloud services side. Um, it's not an easy space for us to invest. It's usually software, software-based. We're not necessarily good at investing in software. We far better understand bricks and mortar, things that you can see. But what that it does is, for me, it enables a, a further investment that's required, which is uh, investing in skills. Um, and I think uh, we were talking, Alton was talking earlier a little bit about how we need to upskill people to capture the opportunities in this fourth industrial revolution. But you don't really jump to the skills without having the, the cloud services, without having the data center, and without having the fiber and the connectivity. So th those are all areas that we're, we're interested in. Um, just to, you know, to, to toot the horn, I guess, the, the, we typically fund across the sector. And all of these brands you'll, you'll know, and, and there are many of you are sitting in the audience. Not only the big players, some of the smaller, the mid-sized, and the, the, the um, sort of earlier stage, I'd call it. But I always get asked, well, what do we do for you guys? You know, we might not understand all the acronyms that you use. You probably don't understand all the acronyms that we use. But I wanted to just highlight you know, the number of emails I get on a daily basis about, you know, can I roll out the checkbook for this sort of opportunity? 
we have four main categories of services, just so you know how to interact with us. We have an advisory service. It's a corporate finance team, and they look to advising clients on acquisitions, mergers, and equity capital raising, typically. IPOs on the major stock exchanges, Johannesburg being primary. We have the financing solutions team, which is the team I sit in. We're balance sheet heavy. We like to lend money, uh, and we lend all sorts of money. We lend dollars, we lend rands, we lend euros. Uh, we lend senior debt, mezzanine, subordinated. We support uh, new entrants into the market. Um, and we have other features like export credit finance. We were last week with Huawei uh, looking at export credit finance. And we also do asset-backed finance. One can't overlook the classic banking model. You know, transactional banking, trade and working capital solutions. This is, what, this is the core of our business. So we might not have lent you money, but we certainly have a role to play in facilitating trade, whether it's import, export, whether it's um, account bank services, working capital facilities. This, it's, it's a big part of our business. And lastly, you know, what we're also very good at is, is managing risk, managing financial risk. You guys manage operational risk, we manage financial risk. So we, we like to understand where the market's going, is it the right time to fix your interest rate or let it float? Is it the right time to hedge a, a dollar to the rand? Um, and we do a lot of research around this. And our global markets team are certainly world-renowned uh, in that space, focusing on sub-Saharan Africa. So th this is the menu that you can, you can uh, call on uh, in terms of engaging with us. Do we do, uh, just to preempt the question, do we start, uh, fund startups? It's very difficult to fund startups with the deposits of effectively widows and orphans. You know, when you go to the bank, you expect your money to be there. We can't have lent it to startups which are typically high risk. So that's on the one side. We are very good at industrializing businesses at work. So really, uh, I think uh, Dark Fiber is probably in the audience. You know, when we first met, it was a reasonably small business, but we're very good at uh, pumping capital into well-run businesses to let them uh, scale. That said, you know, we have um, support for, for small businesses. We have a, a function called the, the Foundry, where we develop fintech startups. And it's more where we are the users as the first round group, where we can actually control and help grow these businesses with us as one of the major users. Um, but as I say, we, we're much better off funding uh, and supporting and industrializing, scaling uh, existing businesses. So that's, that's us in a nutshell. And um, join us for a coffee outside. I think we've got a nice stand out there. And any questions?